So coming into the end of the year, you're probably in a bit of a, a reflective mood, right? Calendar year, not necessarily fiscal year. You're probably reviewing or about to review. You know, your trading year. How did it go? What did you do well? What did you fail out? Failing's not a bad thing either, by the way. You have to experiment, see what works. Sometimes you have to amend your trading rules. You have to pivot. The times change. I think that's probably more true for the folks who are doing things on the short-term side of things rather than folks who are trading in the longer time frames. But I wouldn't wait until we get into the busier holiday season or into January to do the review. I think the review should start now. I know that's what uh, most pros are doing, all types of post-mortems anyway, on their trading and how they, you know, how they performed. Uh, they go back and review their journal, and it's not a diary, but it's like, what were they thinking at the time from an ex-ante standpoint, and then what happened from an ex-post standpoint? This helps you also kind of figure out what was your intuition telling you, right? What did you anticipate was going to happen? What did, what did or didn't happen? And what was the result of the trade? This is how you can really grow by, you know, reviewing your behavior, right? Because behavior predicts where you end up. Not necessarily what you think. You can sit and ideate all day long, but ultimately you've got to put the trades on. There has to be a theory, a thesis. There has to be a trading plan that you execute, whether it's discretionary or purely systematic. Um, discretionary to me is chart reading, and even if you have systematized risk parameters, it's still you know based on a little bit of art and science where someone who's doing something purely systematic using a trading engine like Mechanica or trading blocks, for example, that would be pure science as far as I know. Now, everything at the end of the day is discretionary, right? Because then you still have to choose the inputs. You have to choose, in other words, the inputs being you have to choose what the entry criteria are. You have to choose how to measure the volatility for position sizing and what we call trade management. You have to measure and figure out what your exit criteria are going to be. And then you also have to figure out along the way, like, what are you going to do while you're in the trade? Are you going to add to it? Do you adjust your protective stop when and at what time, at what prices, at what volatility measurement? How do you measure the direction of the trend um, if there is one? And this and that. So you look at those results then and without any judgment on yourself, you know, you can kind of go back and say, you know, in a, in a kind of humorous way, like, what was I thinking? Because <laughs> that's what I do. You know, why did this look so good on paper and not really work out? Um, uh, so one of the things, like, if you want an example in my life, because it's not just about the trading, some of you who are longtime listeners probably remember that before, I don't know what it was, maybe February of this year, we had been doing more audio only types of of um, episodes and we just found out we got much better engagement when we had video so that was something that we got from doing the post-mortem I had a few things I had to get done which is why I didn't start it in January um, first but that was a result of that type of reflection um, and you sure you can go back and say I should have started sooner but based on what you knew at the time you did the best that you could. The same thing goes for like your trading results. What did you really nail? And so, of course, you can look on, on your averages. What was your average winner? What was your average loser? What's your average holding time? Um, see if you can extend that. Right, hold your winners longer. You could also look at, say, what's your largest winner and deconstruct why it was the biggest winner. What was your biggest loser? Usually the biggest winners for the short-term folks were there was just a big move or a big announcement. You were in the right place at the right time, so it was kind of random that you were there. And the biggest losers for most people are, you know, instances where you had a protective stop in and you moved it and you took more of a loss than you should have or you kind of got emotionally invested in, in your trading and you were on a winning streak and you might have started trading too big or too frequently, and then the market's reversed on you, and you took a bigger hit than you should have. Should have. But in that process, though, you get to investigate the next part of the, of the review, which is your feelings. When you look across 
all of 23 as you do your review, like what was the predominant feeling that you had? For a lot of you, it's fear and dread. If you're in a winning position, you feel fear that you're somehow going to lose it. So you need to process your feelings around taking risk, right? Because they're not going to go away. Whatever you feel that's good, look at what the process is that you're following that gives you those feelings. Keep in mind you're powerless over what happens in the market. So it really comes down to your behavior, which is what you can hopefully control because you're powerless over what the market does. So there's no sense in getting all fraught about it. So then take a look at your diary or whatever, your journal, and take a look at, like, over the course of the year, what feelings do you have that you're having to process every day that keep recurring for you? Because in my experience, people who are highly emotional like that, those feelings don't just go away on their own. There is no frequency of gain or magnitude of gains that's going to make that feeling go away. The market's going to keep pushing your buttons, so to speak, so that those feelings are in the forefront of your mind. This is the kind of stuff that we do in the psychological coaching. Is like, where do they come from? And help you process those feelings with behaviors that are very, very conducive to success. Because I know for sure they're not going away. They didn't for me. Until I, I sat down and I addressed them and kind of figured out where do they come from. Usually they come from your upbringing and the environment that you were in or currently are in. And they, you have to address them. So over the course of time, you can see your trading rules, which is what most people take solace in. They do all the physical and the tactical aspect of the trading, but they don't work on their inner game and their inner voice. And if you do that and you look across the, the, the Q4 and all of 23, you might be able to see evidence of what your emotional model is, which to me is the, is, is the engine. That's what's really driving stuff. Now, I'm not a psychologist, but I just know that if you are in constant anxiety, somehow you win from that. And trading then becomes a mechanism for the purpose of delivering anxiety to you. Is that really what you want going into 24? Right? And if you have feelings of insecurity, where do they come from? And what actions can you take? What courses can you take? What can you do to process your feelings around that to build a stronger emotional model? Because it's very difficult to make big money in the markets if your emotional model is weak. And it doesn't mean to be carefree and, and, and act like, you know, reckless with respect to risk-taking. You can take prudent risks and still have an enormous amount of anxiety. But I don't know too many traders, I can't think of any, who are overworked with anxiety and fear that make what they think, based on their goals, are the returns that make the whole thing worth it. Which brings me to another point. If you're putting so much time in and you made X amount of money, you might consider trying to gauge your level of success in the business. And that usually isn't going to come from a dollar amount. You could look at a rate of return, compare it to a buy and hold. But then also look for the amount of time that you put in, both for preparation and then sitting at the screen. What's your hourly wage? Some of you might actually be shocked on how low it is. So these are just a few of the things that you can start to look at as you, de as you deconstruct what your 23 was, what were some of the themes, where did you get your ideas, like investigate everything. Because then you could trace back, like we were talking about, your average winner, average loser, biggest, biggest winner, biggest loser. You go back in time and see, okay, where did this all originate from? Where did I get my ideas from? Did I look at data or was I chasing headlines? Right, because that's also very random. And this can give you insight on your behavior, which to me is the key, because your behavior is very, very important. It predicts where you end up. And most people don't succeed long term just based on luck. We'll take it. We kind of have to. We're going to take the bad luck. We might as well take the good luck, all of us, right? But running a system or trying to run and think of trading like a business, for example, and, and having your success just based on luck, that's hard to sustain. Now, maybe you have great imagination, you have great intuition, so you're able to put yourself in the right place at the right time very frequently. That's probably a skill at that point, right? You have a good feel. 
Most people don't, though. So you have to look at that and figure it all out. So those are my thoughts on deconstructing the year. There's very sophisticated, sophisticated ways to you it to do it. We have, you know, in, in where we work, you know, we have a, a definitive process on breaking all of that down. I'm sharing with you some of the highlights. We, t we tend to go down and look at it from a microscopic standpoint because we, we, we really want to know, we want to evaluate with, with some very rigorous honesty, again, what makes us do the things that we do. Because that's what trading is. It's things that we do. We enter stop orders. We buy or sell at the market. Like all that, all of your behavior adds up to results. And I've always said, even from when I lived in New York, that you have results and you have excuses. And I don't want to live in a world of excuses. I want to be absolutely in control of what I'm doing all of the time. Right? So that requires having a good attitude. Right? It requires having a fairly decent amount of, of discipline for sure. Having a good attitude is really, really important. It's hard to have discipline when you're in a pissy mood. Um, but at any rate, those are some things to consider. Uh, I appreciate you all being here, and I'll be back tomorrow. Take care. Thanks for being here.